our own perspective, we look at it and we say, yeah, I'd do the same thing. I'd say, hey guys, uh, you failed. That was a definitely an epic fail. And uh, I wish I was recording this because YouTube, there'd be a million hits on YouTube because uh, you guys did terrible. This was not something that uh, you guys should be proud of. And Baal abandoned you. Your God abandoned you. And so for us, you know, I know for me, if I was there, I'd say, hey, pfft, I'm, I'm better than you already. Just everything you did, I'm already better than you. I'm already a step ahead of you, and I haven't even said a single word to my own God. And I know for, for you guys, wh how would you guys feel, right? Wouldn't you, wouldn't you feel the same? Wouldn't you look up and say, hey, you know what? Uh, at least I don't look out like a fool like these guys. And, and you'd, you'd, you'd have a, a, an air of confidence. And hopefully, though, there's a part of you that wouldn't go on the prideful side, which is a good thing where... Um, Elijah, I don't believe he fully went to the prideful side. There's a possibility, though, if you look at it in, in different contexts, I could see where, um, if you if you read into it a little more, as you go past the, the story, you could see there's a possibility of his pride uh, stepped into the line there. And I'll get I'll get to that in a second. But anyways, so uh, so then it was it was finally Elijah's turn. 450 uh, prophets of Baal, nothing happened. Now is Elijah by himself. He gets the altar all prepared. He digs a ditch around the altar, and then he gets uh, three, uh, three large water jars, which are there, um, kind of like when you remember when um, Jesus did the miracle at the wedding when he turned the water into wine. Those water jugs, those water jars, it's about like 50 gallons. It's a lot of water, and so he had three of those, and he had and he had people come and fill them up with water and dump them on the altar, and he had them dump them on there so they were. Uh, actually four times, or no, I'm sorry, it was four barrels and three times. I always get that mixed up. Anyways, uh, it all equaled up to each of the tribes of Israel. That was the point. He wanted to have 12 buckets of water dumped on the altar. And the, the, the trench that was, that was dug around the altar, that was actually filled up with water. That's how much water and how much it was saturated uh, that the altar was there. And if any of you have been out camping before, you guys know, uh, and, and even if you haven't, you probably know, wet wood does not burn. That is not how it works. You need dry wood. The drier, the better. That's how, think about any type of wildfire. The drier, the better, because that is what will fuel the fire. But here we had wet wood. We had wet stones. We had wet, uh, the oxen there, the bull, everything was just soaking wet. And what did he do? He got down on his knees bowed his head and he prayed. He said, Lord, you truly are the God of, of all, above all gods. Your name is higher than anything, higher than the most heavens. Lord, show them who you are. Show them how powerful you are. Please bring fire down from heaven. And in that instant, fire, they, everyone there was, was in awe on the mountainside. They saw fire coming down from the heavens and igniting the, the altar, almost like an explosion Imagine like a big action movie, this huge explosion. And the cool thing was Elijah didn't need to be the cool guy walking away. He was there in the moment watching it. And, it, and fire just exploded the altar. Everything was taken up. The, the oxen was taken up. The wood was taken up. All the water was taken up. All the way down, it literally burned the dirt. So there was nothing left of the altar. Everything was taken down to the very dirt below the trench that they, that they dug. How powerful was that in that moment? I imagine the stillness of, of, of that scene there as the fire burned, as the fire uh, extinguished itself, and Elijah just looks around. I imagine he stopped for a moment, and that is where I think he got prideful. That's where I think he said in his heart, I won. I did it. Yes, God, obviously he knew that God was the one that brought the fire down, but he also knew, I think, there was a little bit of pride in there that came in and said, but I was the one. I did this. Look what I did. Look at me. Everyone's staring at me because it's my God that I called on. But what happened then, he had all of the prophets killed, right? He said, don't let any of the prophets go away. And he rounded them up down by the river. There was a river down, down the hill. And he slaughtered all of them. He, he cut down 450 prophets of Baal, showing Ahab, saying, King Ahab, Baal is not a god. He's not, a, he's not a powerful God, but our God, the God of Israel, is the God that we need to have. And then what happened then? Then Ahab was so afraid that he ran back to his queen, back to Queen Jezebel as fast as he could. But the Spirit of the Lord 
right, took a hold of uh, of Elijah, and he ran faster than a chariot, and he went and and he he made it there before before Ahab, and once Ahab got there, he talked to Jezebel, and said, "Hey, here's what happened," and Jezebel wrote a letter, and she said, "Give this letter to Elijah." The letter said, "May God do unto me anything." If I do not have you dead by tomorrow this time. Basically just saying, hey, you know what? I would rather God strike me down if I don't kill you. Because you shamed me. You shamed all of my people. You shamed my God. You shamed my God because she worshipped Baal and Moloch and a bunch of other gods. Uh, But you shamed me and I want you dead. And I think that's in that moment. That's where... Paul, I'm sorry, that's where Elijah, that's where he broke. That's where he had the straw that broke the camel's back. Like I talked about earlier, remember how there was a moment where you felt so alone. You felt so helpless. And that's what happened with with Elijah. He was so afraid. Imagine yourself. Put yourself in his shoes. You're on the spiritual high. You have this amazing thing happen. And then all of a sudden, you... Think for a moment, oh, it was me. And then that's where pride creeps in. And you say, no, no, no. It wasn't God that did everything. It was me that did something. And that's where your pride creeps in. And then one person, one statement, one instance could take everything away. And then you could be crushed. Your legs could be sweeped out from under you, just like how Elijah happened. And Elijah ran for his life. He ran for, he ran for a day. And then his his uh, his servant or his attendant uh, was with him, and he said he said you stay here, and I'm going to go on. He ran for another day, so it was two days running in the opposite direction that, of where he was, and he sat under a tree and he just said, "God, take my life, Lord, take my life because I am not worthy of it." Because he felt so alone, right? He was alone, right? He left his servant. He was with his servant, but yet. And his servant loved God just like Elijah loved God, but he left him behind and he was alone, 24 hours alone. And he said, and that's where he broke. He said, God, take my life. Have you guys been in that moment? Have you guys seen that in your own heart? Have you been able to act in that moment? Now, you may not have gone to the extreme like I did and like Elijah did to say, God, take my life. But... I'm sure there was a moment of weakness. There's a moment of something that, that crept in your heart. But what did God do? God was so beautiful in this moment. He attended to him. He didn't. Uh, he didn't make him suffer because of his pride, or he didn't make him. He didn't uh, make fun of him because he ran away from someone who wrote a letter. If you think about it, you know, he just killed 450 men. He slaughtered 450 men because they failed. A, a woman writes him a letter and he runs for his life. God didn't make fun of him because of that, or God didn't put him down because of that. God didn't talk about his sin in that moment. He saw him as his child, and he took care of him. And that's what God's going to do for you and me. He's going to take care of us. He wants to take care of us. He sent an angel to attend Elijah. He had to meet twice and said, "This is this is what's going to help you. This is what's going to sustain you." And uh, he had two great meals, heaven, literally heavenly meals. And that sustained him for 40 days as he went on a journey. And he came to a mountain and he hid in a cave. And God's words were beautiful there. He said, what are you doing here? He said, come out to the, to the, to the mouth of the cave and, uh, and be there as I, as I will pass by. And a mighty, uh, mighty earthquake happened. But God wasn't in the earthquake. Showing the power, showing that God, God literally shook that mountain. Imagine being there and, and something shaking the very ground that you are, showing the power that you are, that you're underneath. God wasn't in there. It was a mighty, mighty wind, almost like a tornado that passed by. God wasn't in that. Showing that, that he can go from here to there, wherever, doing whatever he may. And a blazing fire, an inferno passed by. God wasn't in that fire. But there was a gentle whisper. And Elijah covered his face because he knew God was in that, in that whisper. 
And how important was that whisper? He hid his face, and in the whisper he said, Elijah, what are you doing here? What's important about that whisper, obviously the words are important because it shows that God didn't want Elijah to be there. He wanted him to be with him. And he was alone again in that cave. He wanted him to be with him. Right, as James talks about, draw, un, draw near unto God and he will draw near to you. But the most important thing that I want you guys to take away from this is that God is whispering to you. God is calling out your name. But God is a gentleman. He will not shout. He will not raise his voice. He will simply whisper. And it's our job to be still. As David said in the beautiful song, be still and know that he is Lord. When we are still, we can hear the whisper. And how do we hear the whisper? It's when we draw near to God, like James says. When we draw near to God, we hear his whisper. And we know who he is. And we know who he wants us to be. That is your calling today. God wants you to be his. But God wants you to draw near to him so you can hear his whisper. Do you want to hear his whisper today? That is what's most important.